We're often told that non-attachment plays an important role in the practice. What we rarely hear is how important attachment is, but it has its role as well. There's a discourse where the Buddha talks about the traditions of the Noble Ones. And there are four altogether. The first three are contentment with the food you get, clothing you get, the shelter you get. And you think from what we know about the four requisites, the fourth one would be being consent from being content with the medicine you get, but it's not. It's something else. It's delighting in developing and delighting in letting go. It's that delighting in developing that's important. You develop good qualities in the mind. You like them. When you get something good in the mind, you hold on to it to see how far it can take you. And with a sense of well-being that comes. If it's the best thing you know in the mind, well, hold on to it. Don't let go of it until you find something better. And you find something better either because you notice on your own that there are other states in the mind. Or because someone else points them out to you. But until you sense that something better, hold on to what you've got. Sometimes it doesn't seem like much. You sit down and focus on the breath, and there's a slight sense of ease, a slight sense of relaxation. At the very least, you've let go of your outside entanglements. Just there with the breath. But right there is the potential for the first jhana. The happiness or the ease or the pleasure that comes from seclusion. And seclusion here means that you let yourself be cut off from those other things. You don't have to think about them. You don't have to carry them around. You stay simply with the good feeling of the breath, even though it may not be accompanied by bright lights or whistles or confetti. Still, it's a nice state, the pleasant state. It may feel like a vanilla state to begin with, but as you stay with it, it starts taking on more flavor. So you hold on to that. And it requires, to some extent, that you be attached to it. Otherwise, you let it go in the middle, or let it go before it develops into anything. And then you can pride yourself on being non-attached, but what you've done is you've dropped the ball. So it's good to have a certain amount of attachment to the pleasure that comes in the meditation, because that keeps bringing you back, bringing you back. And you don't want to let go of it until you find something better. There's a story told in the canon about people in a, in a town who suddenly pick up and move someplace else, leaving a lot of their possessions behind. And so two men from a neighboring town decide to go in and check out, see if there's anything valuable that was left behind. And they get to the town, and the first thing they see is some straw. Well, they figure, well, there's some use for the straw. Let's carry that around. And after a while, they come across, across some flax. Now, flax is more valuable than straw. And so the first man says, well, let's put down the straw and let's take the flax. And the other, second man says, well, I've been carrying the straw around for quite a while now and hold on to it. So the first man drops the straw, picks up the flax, and they go on. And then as they go on, they keep finding things of increasing and increasing value, value until they finally come across gold. The first man at that point has been carrying around silver that he found. So he puts down the silver, picks up the gold. The second man is still carrying the straw that he worked so hard to bundle up the first time around. Now the point of the story, of course, is that when you come across something better, you let go of what you're holding on to. 
But the interesting thing, in the meantime, if you don't come across anything better, you hold on to what you've got. This is important. After all, the first man does hold on to the gold, takes that back home, and he benefits from it. So when you find gold in your practice, you hold on. Even if you find silver in your practice, it may not be the absolute best thing there is out there. But if it's better than whatever else you've got right now, hold on to it. Because the sense of peace, the sense of centeredness that can come from the concentration is a valuable thing. You want to keep with you as much as you can. You find that place inside you that feels solid, secure. And it's natural that you want to identify with it. Now you also know that you're not allowed to identify with things, but don't think of that yet. Stay with this sense of ease, the sense of solidity, because that gives you the ballast you need to not get blown around by the world. It gives you a sense of well-being deep down inside, so that when you come across other things that ordinarily would have tempted you to react with greed or anger or delusion or fear, you don't see the need to react in those ways. You've got something better right here. You know that if you let go of it, you might lose it, so hold on. This way you develop your mindfulness, you develop your concentration, all the good qualities that you're supposed to delight in developing. They develop through this sense of attachment. And John Fung used to say you have to be crazy about meditation if you want to meditate well. In other words, even when it doesn't look like you're meditating, still deep down inside you're staying with something solid. Nobody else has to know. It's your own private internal affair. I know some people, when they go to meditation retreats, they get, their minds get into good, deep states of concentration, and they're afraid to tell the teacher for fear the teacher will tell them to let go of it. Which, of course, aborts whatever you might get from the concentration. There's a rhythm, there's a, a season for letting go. But until the concentration is developed fully, you don't want to let go of it. You hold on to it until it's really solid and secure. It involves work, but then the work, one of the words for meditation, gamatana, means basically the work you have to do, your duty as a meditator. But here it's a duty, it's a, with pleasure, a sense of ease, a sense of solidity. You hold on to it. Allow yourself to get attracted, just to realize its various advantages. The day will come when there's something better that you can hold on to, but in the meantime, hold on to what you've got. An image they often use in, the, in Thailand is of a red ant. You've got red ants that live in the mango trees, and apparently they live off the sap because they certainly don't live off the mangoes. But they build their nests in the trees. They're quite large, and they have fierce bites. Someone climbs up the tree. It's almost like the, mango, the ants are there to protect the mangoes, because they immediately come crawling all over the person who's climbing the tree. And they bite so hard and so insistently that when you try to pull them off, sometimes the body will detach from the head, and the head is still body. And John Fuang used to say, that, hold on to your meditation object the same way that a red ant bites. Just hold on insistently no matter what happens. As I say, come hell or high water, you hold on right here. Or come hell or high wind, like we had the other night, you still hold on to your breath. You realize that this is the most important thing you have. You have to change your priorities, and this is one of the things that concentration does. Things you used to hold on to say, this is, I need this to live, I need that to be happy. But when you've got this sense of solidity inside, you realize, if you allow it to develop, if you stay with it long enough, you begin to realize that those other things are not all that necessary. If you have to do without them, you can. You've got something better deep down inside. So attachment has its place in the practice. The desire to hold on, the, 
the attraction, the delight you find in the meditation is a healthy thing. Without it, the concentration wouldn't develop, the mindfulness wouldn't develop. Meditation would become, would become a chore. I actually know people who, who think that meditation is supposed to be a chore. You're not supposed to like it. But that meditation gets very dry very quickly, and the kind of insights you may get from it are also very disorienting and very dry. You want to put the mind into a state where it feels solid inside, where it has something really valuable that can take as its nourishment. You feed on the concentration. It's one of the sources of strength for the mind. Once you have that strength, then when inside hits, it doesn't knock you over. In fact, it actually allows you to let go in a way that's balanced. In other words, you find something better, you hold on to the insight. You work with insight. Do you find something better than the insight? You let go of the insight. To... You don't have to hold on to anything at all at that point. But in the beginning, we have to hold on. It's like climbing a ladder. You have to hold on to the ladder, you're going to get up to the roof. If you decide to let go midway, just to so that you can let go, well, you get back down on the ground pretty fast. You don't let go until you're up on the roof. Okay, then you're secure. You can let go of the ladder. You don't need the ladder anymore. In the meantime, you go from one attachment to a higher and higher one. There's a sutta where the Buddha talks about this. As you go up the various levels of jhana, each one gets more and more refined until you get to the the highest level of jhana. And the Buddha said, this is the, the ultimate clinging. And this is the highest, most excellent attachment. And the course of the sutta, he takes you from one level up to the next, up to the next. And then Linda happens to mention this. It's a beautiful way to practice the, the practice the path is go from one attachment to the next to the next until finally you get to the point where you don't need those attachments, you don't need to cling, you're not dependent on those things anymore. But until you get to that point, hold on. You've got something valuable here. It may not yet be gold, but it's copper or silver, which is still pretty good. Because if you look at the other things you might let this go for, to focus your attention on, say when you go back home and you're what have you got around? You've got straw, you've got flax. You carry those things around, and you're crazy. The nature of the mind is that as long as it's not totally free, it's got to hold on to something. So you give it something good to hold on to, something that will allow it eventually to open up. This is why states of mindfulness and concentration are so important. They allow you to see more clearly when something is better. So that you recognize that something better when it comes along. So the principle here is you hold on to the best thing you, you experience in the meditation. One, to see if it really is good. Like we had the story the other day of the, the vision. Now the parts of, the, of a vision that come along, if there's a sense of peace and well-being, you don't have to hold on to the meaning of the vision, because that gets the mind all worked up. Question is, is this true? Am I crazy? Am I getting special powers? All those questions get the mind worked up. But if you stay close to the ground, well, there's a feeling of ease here. Let's focus on that feeling of ease. There's no question about that. So, Try to keep close to the ground. Stay away from all those levels of interpretation that come when you have to put a story on things or evaluate in terms of a worldview. You've got the simple sensation. You've got the simple feeling. That's something that's useful. That's Instead of taking the, the flax or the straw, that's at least silver or copper. Take that with you. Where the analogy falls, falls down is that Sometimes the silver or copper, as you hold on to it, turns into something better.
but take whatever seems good and hold on to it, both for the sense of ease and well-being that it gives you, and also to really get to know it well. We're so quick to want to label things as they happen in the meditation. This is good. That's bad. But try to withhold those labels and say, well, I've got time. Let me watch. Let me follow this for myself. There's a story about a John Sow teaching meditation. A lay person came wanted to practice meditation, so John Sow gives him very basic instructions. And the, the student goes off and practices at home and comes back and says, okay, when I practice these are the results that happen. He says, am I doing it right? And then John Sow says, well, that's right or wrong, just keep at it. That was it. He was a man of very few words. But it's an important technique in teaching. Each meditator has to watch for him or herself. You have to learn how to watch and evaluate for your own, on your own. Otherwise, you simply believe what the teacher tells you, and you don't get to exercise your own judgment, which is where the discernment comes from in exercising your own judgment, getting a sense of what is better. What is deeper? What is more refined? What kind of pleasure is more stable, long-lasting? One of the reasons we're here to meditate is so we can develop these powers of judgment on our own, so we don't have to go running to the teacher all the time, or running to the books all the time. You learn to develop a steady gaze so that you can gauge things on your own and learn how to trust your judgment, because your judgment becomes more trustworthy, the more consistent and the more steady you are in your gaze. So we hold on to what's good, both for the sense of well-being that it gives and to test how really good it is, to see if maybe there's something better. Because by definition, as long as you're holding on, there still must be something better. But you hold on to what you've got until that something better comes along.